others. Um, so I'm Helen, I'm one of the um, AIT representatives for the West of Scotland. Um, and I'd like to thank Dr. Peter Hanlon tonight for um, talking to us a bit about um, his role alongside his clinical work as an academic GP. So uh, Dr. Hanlon works with the University of Glasgow um, and is currently, I think he was saying he's just submitted uh, his PhD regarding frailty and also has looked at multimorbidity as well in primary care. So Dr. Hannon, thank you very much. I was just going to mention actually we, we had asked um, if we could leave questions to the end um, and if you want to write any questions in the chat, if you don't have a mic or anything that's fine, I'll keep an eye on the chat at the end. Um, but for now, if we could just leave questions until the end, that'd be great. Thank you very much and yeah thanks for having me thanks for joining good to good to see people here um right let me share my screen and i'll bring up some slides and things can i just check you can hear me and see that is that great perfect ideal so thanks yeah i'm peter hanlon i'm a gp uh, i work two days a week as a salary gp in in fourth valley in in a place called dune just kind of north of sterling and the other three days I work in the Department of Primary Care in Glasgow um, and help, as Helen was saying just finished a PhD which is looking at um, frailty and I'm planning to, it feel, feels very strange being asked to talk about myself and how I got here and things but trying to give a bit of a flavour of what being an academic GP is, is like or what it might entail um, kind of how I got into that which is one of a number of possible routes um, and a bit about how you might approach beginning to get involved in either research or teaching, if that's something that in the future people might want to consider as part of their um, kind of general practice work, essentially. Um, so what I'll cover, what, what do we mean by academic primary care first, as it's a quite broad and wide ranging thing. Um, I'll talk about my experience so far, um, but to highlight this is just one of kind of many ways that people have found their way into academia or research in, in primary care. I'll try and give you a bit of an idea of what I actually do kind of day to day, although that can be quite variable. Because um, I think certainly before I kind of joined the department, it wasn't that visible to me like what primary care, what academic GPs did. And I don't think it's something that we tend to come across that often maybe compared to some hospital specialties where it's much more prominent, you know, people being in uh, research positions. I'll go over a few pros and cons from my perspective anyway of um, an academic career, I suppose, um, and some potential opportunities for getting involved either within training or after completion of GP training um, for people that might be interested in exploring research or teaching um, as, as part of a career. And like, and like Helen was saying, we'll try and leave plenty of time for questions. Um, yes, please feel free to um, if, if there's anything that you do want to ask as I go along, feel free to interrupt if you want um, and or put things in the chat. I'll try and keep an eye out and um, otherwise I'll, we'll have plenty of time at the end, hopefully, for that. So academic primary care, I was trying to find a definition. I found myself Googling it today because I wasn't sure what to say. So there was a paper last year um, kind of discussing where we are now in terms of academic primary care. And it, it kind of encompasses all that they were using the term scholarship, so research and teaching of community-based clinical practice. So that's kind of everything. So it, it, essentially it's research to try and inform what we do as, as GPs, as primary care healthcare professionals. So it's a very broad in terms of all the kind of clinical disciplines that that can cover. It's broad in terms of methods and things like that. So there's lots of people from different backgrounds working in academic primary care, not just GPs, there's other healthcare professionals. There's also people in public health and epidemiology, statisticians, sociologists, qualitative researchers, it's, it's, it's a very broad church in terms of the range of people that are involved in academic and primary care. And that's, that's quite an interesting thing. And it aims to provide evidence to inform and to shape the way we deliver healthcare within primary care. Um, and there's a, there's a huge range of activities going on within that space. So I'll give you a flavor of my experience in that. Um, this is how I got to where I am just now. It looks kind of linear when you write it down. It didn't feel like that at the time. You know, but this wasn't a really, it wasn't a planned route to where I am just now. And there's been lots of meanders and lots of luck along the way of things that have gone well and other things that aren't on this slide, which didn't go well. So um, yes, it, it, there, and there's no one way into it. But I, so I trained at Edinburgh. Um, 
what seems like a little while ago now, but there we go. Um, and first flavour of research was really doing an integrated um, degree, which had nothing to do with primary care at all. It was in immunology. I did malaria vaccine research um, and quite liked it and thought research seemed quite fun. Didn't think too much more about it at the time, really. But um, yeah, it, may, it maybe planted a seed that research was something that was interesting. Um, and from there, I went to Aberdeen Foundation as an academic foundation program there, um, which gave a bit of um, exposure to research, I guess. There was a bit of research training went alongside it, although there was no, you had no dedicated time to spend on research. And as we all know how busy foundation jobs are, you know, it, it was a fairly modest academic training. It was a, a good program and lots of interesting things to kind of learn and stuff. Although like, I think most of what I took from the foundation will have been the stuff we all did in terms of clinical stuff rather than it really um, being a big academic exposure. But it, the, the, you, I met some interesting and enthusiastic senior academics who seemed to be in, enjoying and enthused by what they did, be whatever kind of niche area they were in. Um, and I think that was a positive experience that, you know, that, to encounter people who are kind of doing academic roles, who are passionate about what they do, it was certainly something I took from, from that experience. From there, I went to Fourth Valley. That there's Fourth Valley Royal with its fancy Starbucks, and although it's, it's not not fancy anymore, now that, that Glasgow's got a big, even newer fancy hospital. When I came, this was a fancy hospital, anyway. Um, and yeah, so I did GP training in Fourth Valley, um, and that my GP component was in Dune, where I still work. So this is Dune Castle, um, which is looking looking nice on its sunny day. Um, Two things that I kind of took from GP training that have informed what I do now. So one was that I had two geriatrics jobs, two different six month geriatrics jobs within my hospital placement, which seemed a bit odd when I first started it, but it, 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 I did enjoy them. And the kind of challenges of managing older people with multiple complex long-term conditions and also living with frailty, most of that in a hospital setting when I was seeing it there, but it, it, it did. It did pique my interest, um, and it's something that we see a lot of in general practice as well. So it it it, it struck me at the time as a quite a general practice relevant thing to be learning about. Um, lots of challenges, particularly around you know the sort of things that you'll all be seeing in in in, in your training or practice, depending on what stage you are. But you know, in terms of difficult communication with patients and relatives, and difficult decisions about what the best course of action for patients is. Um, and that, that, that was a challenge clinically, but also something that I was with a research kind of interest, but not much involvement yet beginning to think about. Um, another thing I did kind of alongside that was I was doing a, a kind of online distance learning master's course um, through the University of Edinburgh, and that was in internal medicine. So quite a kind of clinical general medicine focused course. But as part of that, we had to do a research project um, and the little graph there, I, I, for, for that for, um, dissertation, I drew this on PowerPoint, which I felt very proud of at the time. I thought it was quite pretty. Um, but it was, so I got in touch with the general practice department at Edinburgh saying I was doing this course and did they have a project that I might be able to do or help with. Um, and that was a really positive experience. So this, this is the paper that we got out of it. And the reason I'm putting it up is that, so that the, the four names at the, the end, the senior people on it, so Christine Campbell, Brian McKinstry, David Weller, and Hilary Pinnock are four of the kind of senior academics at Edinburgh in the Department of General Practice. And I, at that stage, I was kind of ST1, knew I was doing this course, kind of didn't know what to do about any sort of project that might have relevance to primary care. And I emailed Prof Weller, who was the head, I think he's the head of the Usher Institute now, kind of kind of a big cheese, kind of important. Um, and said, like, I'm a GP trainee, kind of interested in research, don't really know what I'm doing. And he was like, right, come and meet all of us and set up a meeting. And all four of them came and were really friendly and enthusiastic. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. And they kind of met with me a couple of times over a period of a few months occasionally. And we kind of thrashed around some ideas. They were really keen to find something I was interested in doing, really keen to support me as just someone who was kind of interested, didn't really know. It was a systematic review I did, didn't know much about doing that at all. Um, but yeah, as someone who was interested, they were very supportive and very welcoming. And I think speaking to others that have gone down similar routes to me, that's been something that I think all of us have experienced in one way or another. So it's, I mentioned it now to say that if there's any of you are even kind of 
vaguely curious you don't have to be like dead set on becoming an academic but if you're curious in what research involves or want to get the, the flavor um not just the the people here at edinburgh also a lot, a lot of a lot of the other universities are really keen to hear from people that even just want to find out a bit about what what it's about um and although they're busy people with big you know full email inboxes tend to be responsive to people who are just kind of wanting to test test the water so that was a really positive experience i found and kind of led on to my first kind of dedicated research training time so that was as a gp trainee i got a screds clinical lecturer post which some of you may have heard of some of you may not have they're not that well advertised i don't think so this is a post that you can you can get as a gp trainee um when I did it, it was specifically for ST3s, and it's, it extended your ST3 from one to two years, and you did 50% clinical training, the same way as you would be doing normally, and 50% academic training, particularly with a focus on research. They're now a bit more flexible at when you take them up. So um, basically every, every uni, so Glasgow, Edinburgh, certainly Dundee and Aberdeen, St Andrews, I might have one, not sure. Um, I have one post at any one time. So when someone leaves and finishes training, it becomes vacant and they advertise it. And you can now take it up from ST2 or ST3. Um, and yeah, it gives you a chance to explore research in general um, alongside doing general practice training. So I stayed in my same training practice and just dropped to 50% there um, and got some time to spend at... Glasgow, where I still, still work. Um, so there I learned about doing analysis of big data sets. Here are some of the data sets that I have dabbled with, some of them more successfully than others. Um, but I was quite interested in, as I've said, frailty, multimorbidity, all aging, complex patients, that kind of thing. And one of the skills that I did not have at all, but seemed potentially relevant to that is um, Kind of analyzing existing data. So the one I got started with is the UK Biobank, which is, uh, you can see its logo there. It's a big cohort of half a million people that our department about a year before had bought access to and they were wanting to do some research with. Um, so I kind of got to know some people who were had some skills in doing that stuff, learned how to do some coding and analysis and a bit of basic statistics and kind of went from there. Um, and from that, I started to look at frailty within UK Biobank. Um, and with a bit of luck and lots of help, got a paper out of that in the, in the Screds thing. So this was a paper looking at frailty in relatively younger people than is traditionally thought of as frail. So UK Biobank's basically people between 40 and 70. And we showed that you can identify frailty in people who are younger. That's got a massive social gradient. So the vast majority of people who are identifiable as frail, if you want to call it that, younger, are in the most deprived kind of 20% of the population, mostly people with multiple long-term conditions. So this was this was from that paper and that even in this younger age group, if you've got four or more long-term conditions on the kind of x axis at the bottom there, I think it was 17% of people, even this younger age group, were living with frailty and they were, they were more likely to die by about a kind of twofold increased risk of mortality even at younger ages um, in, in, in these people. Um, so that, we were, we, were, we were lucky with how we got it published. It was interesting for me to learn some skills in how to kind of do that sort of work. And it's certainly something I've taken forward and developed in my um, PhD. And it's, it was a kind of an opportunity to do a bit of research in a clinical area I was interested in and it sparked off various other connections and opportunities for other projects and people to speak to and all this kind of stuff. So it was, I found it a really positive experience um, from that post. That makes it sound like I went into it with an idea of what I wanted to do and then I just did this paper and came out of it. Not how it felt at all. You kind of arrive and you have no idea what you're doing and you're kind of, you get to know people gradually and you start some projects and they go nowhere and others kind of work. So. I guess this is, this is, this is the, the flaw of this kind of linear way of representing stuff, but there's, there's lots of dead ends along the way. But that, that, that's what went well in the, in the Screds post, as well as finishing training. I then did a one-year NES funded fellowship after CCT, um, which there are, so those are advertised every year. So they are, they're flexible in how much of the time you spend in research. They basically will, will pay for 
it's up to 80%, but people do them just 20, one day and everything in, in, in between. Um, and yeah, similarly, you get, you get some time to spend in an academic department. So I continued some of what I'd been doing before. I got interested in that year in the idea of trials and representatives of trials. So this, the idea that struck me in clinical practice in that a lot of the patients we see, to me, were likely to be different from the relatively healthy people that, you, that are involved in clinical trials that the treatments are tested on. Um, it's really started to bucket it down here and I've got a flattish roof. So apologies if you've got rain sound effects in the background, but um, so yeah, became interested in the, that problem of the mismatch between the populations that we treat and the populations that treatments are tested on. But actually relatively little had been looked at on that. So we did some work looking at multimorbidity or comorbidity counts in people in trials versus people who are being treated for those same conditions in routine cares. This is one of the figures from that work, which showed that the distribution of number of comorbidities in, in trials in the blue was considerably less than in primary care, even if when you match them for age. So kind of, I mean, it's, it's, it's fairly obvious when you think about it, the sort of people we see in primary care, but it confirmed my suspicion that, that there are a good bit sicker than the people that they're testing the treatments on. Um, and it, it, it speaks to some of that complexity that I think is interesting as to how we make decisions in that context, because often the guidelines are a lot more simple and clear cut than the decisions that we tend to have to make as, as, as GPs. And what I've tried to develop my research towards is how to better inform those decisions. Um, so from there, and, and during that year, I applied for a PhD fellowship. So that, um, was basically a post that would fund my time for three years to do a PhD and that's what I started in 2019 and I've just submitted last month. Um, so my funding came from the Medical Research Council, there are various others that fund clinical PhD, so you get you get paid to, to do your project. Um, my fellowship paid for some clinical time as well, so I was able to kind of keep working as a GP, but that was kind of funded by the Medical Research Council, which was quite... It, it, it was good in terms of flexibility because if there's stuff that you really need to be doing, you're kind of free to the practice. So they're kind of happier to let you go and that kind of thing. Um, doing it during a pandemic made it a bit trickier, but you know, uh, yes, that, it all kind of changed a bit. Um, but yeah, so I want, that's been exploring more this idea of frailty, how we quantify it, what it means for the decisions we make. Um, and we did looked at three, three different long-term conditions. So one was diabetes. Um, we did this bit of work that came out of it. I put this one up to highlight the second name on there. Isabella Ferre was an excellent um, intercalating medical student that I supervised um, in the first year of my PhD to do this review, which we did together, um, which is one of the kind of fun bits about these posts is you, you quite quickly develop. Now, I, I didn't have that many skills, but I'd done a few things and you quickly get asked to kind of you know, help people do things or do bits of supervision. And that's been a really fun, I think, part of what I've been doing so far. Um, it's been mostly integrating students and some master of public health students I've supervised, but you know, starting to do some of that kind of stuff has been an, a, a good aspect of academic primary care that I've started to do a bit more recently. Um, so with Ezzy's work, we found that frailty is common in diabetes, yes, which is no surprise. We found 118 different studies that had looked at these kind of questions of prevalence. They used 20 different measures of frailty between them and they specified them all really differently. And um, yeah, it was all a bit of a mess because like no one's measuring anything the same way, um, which yes, was kind of an interesting finding in itself. Tricky to know what to do with it, but there we go. Um, we also looked at the idea of trials and how different trials are to people that we see in primary care. So on one, challenge is that trials don't measure frailty in general. That's very rarely done. But we found that it was possible if you go, go back and get the trial data itself, you could quantify frailty within a trial population um, through a ways I'll not go into great detail on just now. But it showed that it was possible that we can use the trials that we already have of treatments and we can go back and assess frailty within those people and begin to make some statements about whether risks and benefits may begin to differ in um, people who are living with frailty. Um, 
This is from that paper, which shows that people living with frailty within a trial are more likely to experience serious adverse events, so basically to be admitted to hospital or to die, even within the trial setting. So there is a bit of frailty there in trials, we just don't measure it. Um, and there's probably more we could s learn from existing trials about how best to treat people who are living with frailty. Um, and the final thing we did was look at how much people in trials differ from people in the community in terms of what actually happens to them. Um, so we'd looked at um, comorbidity counts before. This was taking trials of hypertension and in the purple dots, this is how many hospitalizations and deaths we'd expect people in the trial to be having based on people who get the same treatments in primary care. And the red and the blue dots are how many actually happened. So kind of, I mean, it's, it, it, a lot of it's kind of stating the obvious. It's kind of, it, it's confirming what we kind of suspect with the frail multimorbid populations that we treat, but um, further evidence that trial populations are arguably not that fit for purpose for the sort of treatment decisions that we're making day to day. Um, and the challenge then is how to better inform those. Um, but that was also some interesting work. These are some of my colleagues. I put these up to highlight that that's, that's how I got there. Um, everyone will have a different story. So the two top faces are my current office mates. So Hamish and Marianne, they're both doing, they're kind of both in the last year of their PhDs as well. We've kind of been fairly simultaneous the way we've come through. Hamish did a bit of surgical training and then trained as a GP. He then worked in Tanzania for a bit. I think either in his training or just after, and then got one of those NESS kind of post CCT research posts. Um, he was there before I joined, and he's got really interested in lifestyle and the interaction between lifestyle and deprivation, and how. So he's interested in like more newer lifestyle risk factors like TV watching time and sleep and these kind of things, and also how they interact and the challenges of dressing these in the context of high deprivation when people are facing multiple complex challenges and things. So he's doing some really interesting work in that space. Marianne is interested in health inequalities broadly and multimorbidity and is doing some really interesting work based in Drumchapel where she's um, doing some quantitative stuff and also meeting with lots of community associations and groups and so on and trying to understand how that kind of shared knowledge and community can be harnessed to better promote health within these communities where people are um, perhaps not getting a lot of their information from the kind of typical public health campaigns we think about, you know, they're listening more to their community and how can we kind of work within that and learn from that to see how we can address health. Um, the three at the bottom are folk that I shared an office with when I first joined and they were kind of at at the stage I'm at now when I joined. So David Blaine is the one on the left there. He's um, He started from a kind of health inequalities point of view. He's been really involved in GPs at the deep end. Um, we're very, very proud of David. He recently won a, a early career researcher of the year thing from the Society of Academic Primary Care in the UK. And a lot of that was for his advocacy work and the stuff he's done around in it, inequalities. Um, been some really interesting work. Katie in the middle is interested in stroke and treatment burdens, so the kind of workload of patients who are living with stroke. And she's a GP partner and a trainer and a senior lecturer. She's like about the busiest person I know, um, but juggles all those plus her family and you know, does some really interesting work. And Batesh at the end, he, he does probably work quite similar to what I do in terms of multiprobidity and data sets. He also was a partner 50-50 for a while. He's now more full-time at uni, but all of us have had very different experiences, interests, roots into that, um, and there's a huge variety. And not all of us, I think mine looks a wee bit like I started off wanting to be a researcher and kind of, it's kind of how it's ended up, but certainly various people coming into at different stages of careers and not all of us by any means starting out as GP trainees thinking this is what we want to do. Um, a lot more stumbling into things than it maybe appears. Um, I'll give a little flavor of what actually day-to-day -day my job involves. Although like every week, that's one of the nice things about academia, every week is quite different. Um, most of what I'm paid to do is research. So that's the bulk of the time. And that involves everything from planning, which is mostly meetings. There's quite a lot of meetings. Um, and I mean, planning involves like reading and thinking. I, I still find it hard to like actually do like thinking and think it's work. There's definitely a kind of urge to busy yourself. Um, but the, that, is, that is part of it, kind of trying, th thinking of good questions and forming them properly is kind of a, a, 
a good part of what the what, what the job involves. There's a lot of applying for stuff. There's applying for funding and for the next job and that kind of thing. Um, that's probably one of the downsides. There's actually doing the research itself, which in what I've done is a lot of it's been kind of analysis of big data sets, but that can involve kind of interviews with people, patients, professionals, that kind of thing. There's lots of lots of different methods that that involve depending on what sort of research people are doing. A lot of writing, be that papers or applications or um, other things that go along with that and presenting findings either at conferences or to stakeholders, patient groups, that kind of thing. Um, and depending on where you're at with projects, weeks will be very much skewed towards one of those things, um, often trying to juggle many of them, but that's that's what a lot of the work involves day to day. There is teaching. Now, my, my pathway has been quite research focused. There are definitely teaching routes into academia, and that is, I'm, I, I talked about research because that's what I do rather than because that's what's important. You know, there's, there's lots of teaching posts and lots of really interesting things people do within that. I do a bit of supervision, like I've said, and I do a bit of clinical teaching um, to undergrads as well. Um, and then there's clinical work. So I currently work as a salaried GP um, two days a week um, in Dune, and the, the amount has varied with research jobs and pandemics and various bits and pieces. So it kind of goes up and down. I think that's most people's experience is that, you know, it, there's a bit of juggling of all that kind of stuff. But that's that's what I tend to do. Um, some pros and cons of, I'll try and keep these kind of generic rather than my own personal experience, but there's, there's some definite pros to an academic aspect to a career. I find it really interesting and it's definitely varied. I think most people that do it find it interesting and part of that's because the next point of autonomy, like I do what I do because that's what I've found interesting. It's what I've been lucky enough to have some success in terms of what projects have come off and it's all become very interesting to me. My colleagues all do very different stuff to what I do because that's what they've been interested in. And it's, I think that's maybe one of the biggest differences to clinical work in terms of the autonomy you have to make it your own. And it's, it's definitely an opportunity to think and explore your own interests and to be curious about stuff and to have dedicated time to devote to something like that, um, which in the busyness of general practice where you're by definition dealing with everything, um, it's it's an interesting counterpoint to, 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 to that anyway. Another big pro is flexibility in terms of the work. So um, I, I really like this. I, you know, clinical days are long and hard. They start early, they finish late. And it's hard to juggle stuff because Certainly, my practice, we've all got young kids, you know, it's all that is all a big challenge. The, the, the academic days are like the polar opposite of that. So my my oldest daughter started P2 yesterday. I could go and drop her off and pick her up early and just had to not schedule a meeting then. And that was fine. And you do some in the evening to make up the time. And, you know, it's only on you if your stuff doesn't get done. So it is definitely more flexible that way. Um, the downside of that is that work can easily bleed into other aspects of life, you know, particularly if you are juggling things, you're finishing things off in, in, in evenings, you can sometimes feel like you've never properly got away from it either. But, you know, the, the flexibility definitely helps. Um, you can go for a run at lunchtime and that's fine. It's a very pleasant kind of aspect of, of um, it's not a reason to do it by itself, but it's definitely a perk. Um, and travel is another one, it's not been so much with COVID and the pandemic and that kind of thing, but um, a few of the kind of pictures from our kind of various conference trips and things, so Montreal's at the top, Chicago's at the bottom, we had um, conferences where a lot of us went over to there. More recently, the, 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 the nice lake one is The Hague, that was in June, I got to go to the Dutch College of Primary Care's Science Day to talk about some of the frailty work that we were doing, um, and that's a nice, a nice aspect to it. Um, and yeah, the, 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 the kind of group photos of our department is, I think we in Glasgow certainly and in other departments in Scotland, I think have as well, quite a nice, um, although we're all kind of working in slightly different things, there's lots of overlap. Um, certainly when we're in the same building, there was a good team spirit. It's been more challenging to keep alive when people have been remote, but we're kind of moving back towards being in the same building and that's all very positive. A few definite cons, kind of as I've kind of mentioned, the, the flip side to the flexibility is the whole boundaries thing and that 
there's certainly lots of evenings spent with a laptop and you know um academic work can tend to just i think the difficulty is every task takes forever like everything just takes months to get done and it's easy to be overwhelmed by the amount of stuff that needs done and if you're not careful it can just kind of take over a bit when you're getting more stressed and that definitely does happen um there's a bit of a kind of serving two masters thing in terms of clinical jobs and academic jobs that you know both will want your time a bit and um that can be a challenge sometimes the pace is really different so it's it is slow like just things happen more slowly everything just takes longer to get everything takes longer than you think to get done and that that doesn't suit everyone's temperament is that you know that's not necessarily a good thing um the short-term contracts thing depending on what like how big a part of your career you want academia to be there's not just a permanent job you can go up and get you know a lot of these posts are fixed term little things there's not necessarily an obvious next step after them and um, you know people make it work but it's there's not a definite pathway through it and the other thing that um is is true of academia is that rejection is normal you know getting papers rejected getting fellowship applications rejected all this stuff just it happens to everybody and it, it, it is normalized and you get used to it but it's 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 different from you know clinical work where it definitely has its own stresses and it's not that one's more stressed than the other necessarily but um there's a it is a competitive world where clinical work is not and you know you're clinical work you're part of a team and you're doing a good job for patients and that's hard to do often but that's that's kind of your focus there is definitely a having to assert yourself and justify why your research needs done and over someone else's um and while the team you work in is often very supportive there is that just it, it is a competitive environment and that for me is a downside in terms of just how it feels sometimes um but it's the nature of the beast i suppose a few words about getting involved happy to take questions on any of this i'll kind of put it up so that it's i've mentioned these things and if any of them you know want to know more about happy to talk about this so the, the, the first i've put i hesitated putting this on but i think it's useful to know you, you can get involved in research informally you don't have to and there's lots of options to get paid to do it and not not everyone does this but i found when i was initially interested departments were very welcoming for you to dip your toe in the water and um, you know approaching them that way it's it's not paid work initially and it's not that yeah it's not that you have to do that to get involved in academia because not everyone has the time or whatever to, 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 to do that but it is it is an option if you want to just kind of figure out what's going on and there's not an obvious thing to apply for that's available however there are lots of chances within primary care to have some time to at least try out research in academia or teaching and see what you make of it. So the first is the one I did initially, the Screds post. Like I say, they are advertised kind of whenever they come up. You have to be a bit lucky in terms of your timing and training as to whether it comes up when you're um when you're available. Um and but they're they're I found a really good opportunity. Not everyone that does them does what I've done and stays in academia. Some people do them and they take the skills they've learned and take them with them and do other things, you know, go into partnerships or do other work with, you know, alongside their, their practice that isn't that isn't research. Um, but some useful things for building skills. Post CCT, there are these NES academic fellowships, which are for research. There's other NES fellowships as well, which um, are probably better advertised, at least where when I was coming through. There's ones in education, which are are different, but are, are are very valuable if teaching is something that you're interested in. There's other ones like the Health Inequalities Fellowship, where you do a bit of clinical work, often in um, the Hunter Street practice, the homeless practice in Glasgow or in, in, in other um, deep end practices as well as some more academic work usually based at NES and then for people that are kind of a, a bit more sure they want an academic aspect to your career there is the opportunity to do a PhD which um, ideally you want to find a fellowship that will pay you to do that that's definitely how those of us that have pursued that as GPs have have, have done it one exciting opportunity that's come up recently is the Welcome, as in the Welcome Trust multi-mobility PhD scheme. So that started last year. It's 
a Scotland-wide scheme for healthcare professionals um, to do PhDs around the topic of multimorbidity. Um, they are currently advertising for the second year. It's going to be running for five years. They've got funding for, and it's set projects. So um, supervisors write a kind of project brief and you, people can apply for those. And we've had a number of GP applicants as well as other specialties apply for them. And there's also personal fellowships like what I did, where you come up with a project. I say yourself, you come up with a project along with supervisors and so on, and you apply to a funder for that. So that's that's the route I went down. And most people doing that have done one of these earlier type posts before. Um, few people go into that just with an idea completely uh, you know, off their own back. Often there's a bit of time they've had beforehand to kind of get an idea of what they want to do and what their interests are. Um, but yeah, so those are, those are the kind of, well, some of the opportunities that are out there. Um, I think that's my last slide. It's not, oh, it's, oh, jinx, something happened. Yes, that was the last slide. I'll stop there. I'll stop sharing there, okay? And I'll see there's a couple of questions in the chat that I've not had a chance to read yet. Um, but yeah, thanks for listening. And I don't know, Helen, how do you want to do the questions? Do you want to guide me as to what to answer first, or shall I just- well, That was great, thank you very much. Really insightful. Um, and I think it has raised a few questions. So I might just start with um, the questions that we have in the chat. And then I know that Julian's got her hand up. So um, I'm sure you can see it yourself. Um, the first question comes from Vina, um, Vinayak Mishra. Apologies if I mispronounce that. Uh, thank you for your talk, GP in the Northwest Coast, who is also interested in database analysis and meta-analysis. Any suggestions with regards to course or programs to get involved, Peter? Okay. Um, good question. It depends what you want to get out of them, I suppose. I could run you off some possible courses that you could learn some stuff in. I suppose uh, it's, I'd kind of want to know a little bit more about quite why you're interested in that and what you wanted to do with it, I suppose. Um, not sure if Vinayaki, you've got access to our mic. We could maybe ask that directly to you. While you're considering, if, 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 if you don't, don't, don't feel like you have to describe too much if you don't want to. Um, there are, there's online platforms like, so Coursera is one, which is one of these kind of mass participation um, online university platform type things. And they've got some either free or quite cheap interactive courses that you can learn some basics in terms of um, statistics and analysis, meta -analysis, that kind of thing. Um, they're quite interactive and bite-sized, which are quite good ways of getting started. I found learning as learning while being involved in part of a project, I found much, I found really valuable. You can do a wee course alongside that kind of thing, but often if you can kind of find someone that does that, that's willing to kind of teach you bits, it depends you know, if, 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 if you're really keen to learn that kind of thing, um, is often a bit more applied, you may well get something out of it as well in a way that if you're just doing a course, you wouldn't necessarily. Um, but yeah, so Coursera is a good, and there's Stanford University have some various kind of statistics for medical professionals type. Only I think they cost ten dollars to kind of sign up for the course, and there's lectures and that kind of thing. They are quite useful ones. Um, taking any more than the basics um, would, yeah, it would, be, it would be worth speaking to someone that's doing something like you want to do, and see if you can link into something while learning, because that's a bit more interesting than just kind of the straight course type stuff. I'm not sure if that answers Great. the question. Happy to follow up. So we're going into the more teaching side of things. So Laura Douglas asks, from your experience, in order to go into lecturing, do you need a PhD or a master's for this? So it depends what you mean by lecturing. So I, one, I meant to say this, I had it in my notes and I didn't actually say it. So there's a massive spectrum of like academic activity within GPs. So not everyone that's an academic GP is like a professor of general practice. That's, that's their main job and things like that. So there's lots of, there's lots of GPs are actively involved in aspects of teaching. Some of them are employed by the university. Some of them kind of subcontracted to the practice and that kind of thing. So you, you can be involved in this stuff and not have a master's or a PhD. And, and lots of people do that and do it very well and do it successfully. Um, to be a lecturer, as in the university employs you to do some aspect of that, um, doesn't always need a PhD. So a, 
a kind of senior research job does need a PhD. The teaching positions, no, they don't. Those wanting to progress often are advised later in careers to do that. But you know, certainly, if you know, if you're looking to kind of get involved in teaching, be that undergraduate, wherever, there's there's various routes into that, and they don't all need a PhD. Um, do you need a? Ma I mean, yeah. I would say there's no one thing that you need for anything. If that may, you know, in terms of getting initially involved in stuff, um, there's lots of people who have begun to do these sorts of things without those sorts of things. And but what tends to happen is if you then want to make that a big part of your career, there becomes things that it makes sense to do. Um, but that's quite specific to situations. So not to start, but maybe if you want to progress further. I think so. Yeah, I think that's it. So certainly to start, no, none of it's needed. And you can definitely have, you can have a, a long and involved career that involves research or teaching and not have a PhD. Lots of people mm -hmm. do that, mm -hmm. um, but it depends, yeah, on other stuff. I'll quickly ask Mel's and then I'll go to you, Gillian. So Mel um, Matha asks, do you know of any equivalent post-CCT clinical academic fellowships in England? Uh, yes, so there are. I don't know them as well in England. They have, they generally have more and they're, they're a bit more set out. I've, they, what do they have? They have, they have a, a academic training pathways, certainly. And then they have in practice fellowships. I think they, they call them. So they are pre PhD and they pay you, I think 50, 50 usually, I think. And they're like two year long type things. I think, I think that's what the in practice fellowships are. If I've got that name wrong, apologies. There's then, so they have NIHR, which is the National Institute for Health Research fund PhD fellowships, as well as some other posts. And they fund a lot more than get funded in Scotland. Um, and then they also fund post PhD. But so there's, there's a kind of much more of a ladder in England. Um, and they have them, you know, for people who are just finished training, wanting to dip their toe in the way I was doing. Um, and I think they're called in practice fellowships. If that's not what that is, something else exists that is that, but yeah. Great, Gillian. Hi, thank you very much for your uh, very interesting talk, Peter. It's been really helpful. Uh, my question was just about the salary and the pay. So if you're a salary GP, let's say you're doing four sessions, you get paid a certain amount. And then if you were to do research, uh, you were obviously paid to do that research. Would they be able to sort of do a salary match to what you pay, get paid clinically, or do you get a sort of a pay drop? Uh, because of that, because I have heard that some of my colleagues who do something like that, they do complain that sometimes their clinical colleagues who do eight sessions purely clinical, they may not quite be matching up to them. So I just wanted to hear what your thoughts were. Yeah, so the clearest one to say is that, so the, the, the SCREDS clinical lectureships where you're in training, they are paid as a trainee. So you, you, you get the same training as you would as a purely clinical trainee. There's the kind of your salary point continues and you get the 45% kind of in practice supplement or whatever they call it that um, you get with that. Um, after that, obviously, like when you start working as a GP, depending on what sort of GP you're doing, your pay will be different. And so it's, it's, it's less strictly matched once you've CCT'd, I suppose. Um, I've continued to be paid essentially as a registrar, but with that same kind of 45% thing, which given that I've now been doing it for, I don't know, 10 years, something like that, you know, because it keeps incrementing. I, my, so my, my academic salary is about, it's roughly equivalent to what my salary GP salary is. It's certainly, it's not as simple, but it's it's not massively different. It's probably less than I would make it as a partner, depending where you work, I suppose. But um, so yeah, it's not strictly matched, um, but you are paid as a clinician. So you get paid a lot more as a clinical academic than you do as someone that's not clinically qualified within a university, um, which may or may not be fair on those people, I suppose. But it's, you know, if, if, if you're coming in as a GP, you, you are paid as a clinician, um, you, you probably, yeah, in terms of hours worked for pounds earned, it's probably not the most lucrative thing you could do with your time, but it's, it's certainly your, it's a privileged position as a researcher to be in where you're, you know, you're, you're paid well for the work you're doing. And you're, you're also, it's, it's a big training aspect to these posts. So it, it's considering 
how much time you're given to just learn and that kind of thing. It's it's not bad. Great, thank you. Um, Laura Douglas has asked a question. She's a salary GP, keen on doing research in the practice that will pay, pay the practice, even if it is session pay for time. Any areas you, you would suggest to look at outside of pharmacy trials? Okay, so this is, so as in, the, if this is the, as in for your practice to be involved in research is what I'm kind of seeing that as or as in to be doing research within the practice. Um, so it's a good question. Um, did you and Mike, Laura, were you wanting to add something there? Or I was just going to say yes, absolutely. That was what I was trying to write. Yeah. So it's a good question. Um, so the short answer is lots of practices do get involved in research and. It will be project specific what this means exactly, but they are compensated for that work. Um, now, it depends very much what that is. There is something called the Primary Care Research Network. I think that's what it's called, which is um, Scotland wide kind of practices that are theoretically open to being involved in research. And there, there's a kind of mailing list that practice manager gets sent things of studies that are going on. Um, Part of that is just around kind of recruitment and it's very light touch, like the practice don't have to do anything. It's just kind of permission for the network to approach their patients for studies. There's other things where they're looking for practices to be more actively involved. And most, most studies, depending on what they are, but they will, they will cost the time of professionals that are devoting that to it. So, I mean, one very, it's a, it's, it's a very kind of minimal low key example, but I'm currently trying to do, trying to apply for some funding to interview some practices around what, what, they, what they mean by the term frailty, what it means to them, what the pros and cons of actually identifying people as living with frailty. And we're costing in the GP's time. Like if, if anyone is willing to speak to us, we'll pay them, you know, by the hour to do that, for example. Now that's, I suspect that's not the, quite the sort of research you're meaning, but you know, most projects will factor in compensating for practices time if they're doing that the research network would be the way of kind of making yourself visible as theoretically open to that or if there was a particular area you're wanting to get involved in it would be finding academics that are doing that and seeing kind of what can what can happen if that makes sense that's really interesting i didn't know that at all yeah really thank you i'm trying to set it up so that's really helpful francis mayer who's our head of department and batesh jani are the clinical leads for the network um, so, like you know, if if you if you were interested in that kind of thing and your practice had any questions, they would be a good contact. Fab. Um, another kind of a more of a practical question: um, uh, How do we apply for screds? Is it the same as we apply for training? Um, so no, it's not the same. It's it's like a total mystery. If I'm totally honest with you, it like it just pops up. Like there's an email comes out from Nez to be like, oh, we've got this post. And actually, no one from Nez. Well, no, that, that that that's bad. I shouldn't say that about Nez. When I applied, no one from Nez knew what it was. Um, they're just like they 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 forwarded this email that Glasgow had sent them, and it's it's a Glasgow University job offer. Um, if it's something that you're interested in, any of you, like just even in principle, it's worth kind of emailing the person, like emailing the head of department of, assuming you're in Glasgow, it would be of Glasgow, or if you're somewhere else, of wherever that is. Because they'll they'll know when they've got a screds post coming up, and that's how I so I, I had a heads up because I knew that the person was going to be CCTing at whatever time, and I was going to be around about the right time for it. And they'd said, you know, it'll come around about in June, and you should keep an eye out and apply because it'd be easy to miss if you're just kind of it's not well advertised really. Um, but no, it's a university job, and it, the same for whatever uni is advertising it. Um, and unless you know what it is, it wouldn't be obvious. It's a kind of stepping out of training, but still doing your training type thing. So, um, yeah. So when you say contact um, your local, presumably Glasgow, do you mean uh, someone within the University of Glasgow? So yeah, if 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 you were if if you were a GP trainee who was kind of interested in research or wondered if you might be and wanted to know how to get involved, I would email Francis Mayer, who's the head of department. Okay. She was very nice. She's super busy. Um, she might take a little while to reply, but she then sent a nice email. When I did that, so I, I emailed Francis saying I'm interested, in, and then she sent me this very nice but quite rushed email, being like, "I'm really busy, but really good to talk to you. Phone me at my house on this evening 
not not this evening as in like <laughs> on like a, a, a date an evening um and then she forgot she'd sent that so like I, I i phoned her house and got her husband and then i was like i'm, I'm peter i'm a gp and francis said to phone her and then she was like oh oh she totally forgot and it was super awkward but she was lovely you know so like she's she's very approachable she's very nice um so yes and it's it's, it's, it's it's a fairly small world as academic GP, like the, the equivalent people in other and people getting in touch just because they're interested tends to go down well. So um, they'll tend to want to speak to you. Last question on the chat um, is from Adnan Ali. Uh, I'm currently a GPST2. I wish to pursue research, maybe a PhD post CCT in Europe, maybe the Netherlands or Sweden, um, to have experience of working abroad with the security of a job. Any tips on how to go about this? That's a good question. Mm. Um, okay. Don't know if Brexit makes it more challenging. Yeah. So there, I'm sure there's complexities that I can't even think of that, you know, like that, but at the same time, researchers move lots and academic primary care is quite an, so there's a good international community around academic primary care. So we, we quite often go to the North American conference um, like I said, I was in the Netherlands because, and that, that was off the back of the North American conference that I got invited there. They've, um, so you mentioned the Netherlands. The Netherlands is interesting. I don't know how that would work. They have a really good scheme or a really established scheme of their GP trainees doing PhDs. About 20%, I think, of their GP trainees do a PhD within their training. Yeah. And when I was over there, they were presenting what they've been doing and like they're they're proper amazing like they 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 had done some really like a lot of them had done like a, a small scale but a full trial um within their PhD and one had developed an app to like help people managing incontinence they trialed it they'd interviewed people that did the app they had you know all this stuff and that so you know there's there are places in Europe with really good clinical PhD setups the Netherlands ones it was kind of very much part of their training so quite how it would work kind of wanting to you know that but yeah I would I would start off it depends how specific you you know what you want to do is um certainly most senior academics will have some links abroad that's just it's often the way these worlds work speaking to someone local and talking about your interests and getting some advice from someone that you can easily speak to would be a good way of starting um lots of academics do go abroad to do work Going abroad as a GP to do a PhD, that you know that that might be complicated, but I'm sure it's possible. Um, the Netherlands and Sweden both have you know lots of really you know lots of really interesting epidemiological stuff relevant to primary care going on. There's lots of articles I can think of that work with people there. So you know there would be ways in, but I you probably need to have a connection to do that. I would start talking to people who might know and okay. see where it leads. Thank you. No. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. Much appreciated. No That's really helpful. Cheers. No worries. Anyone else got any questions they'd like to, to ask Peter whilst he's here? No. Nope. Can't say that yourself, but that's almost absolutely perfect timing. <laughs> 28 minutes past it is it is bang on so no that was that was really interesting thank you and as i say i have recorded the session so if anyone wants to watch it back or um or anything then i can share that next week um and i don't know if there's anything peter any links to anything or anything that would be handy to share with anyone when i do send um the feedback survey if there was i don't know anything yeah um i could certainly send you what will i send you i will send you a couple of things i'll send you my email address because happy you know if anyone's got any follow-up questions happy for you to get in touch um i'll great. pop our department website and i'll pop a link to the welcome milk morbidity phd thing because yeah. it's it, it's <laughs> It's being advertised in the way that a lot of these things are not advertised that well and it'll have links to other relevant things so yeah if i'll, I'll pop that yeah that would all be amazing there, and, and then i can share that, that with everyone um Fine. next week so yeah super That's thank good. you so much thank you not at all. thank you and i don't know if any of you guys are interested in the future we are looking to set up the next portrait session surrounding kind of sports medicines so it's talking to gps who work within sports medicine so keep an eye out for that thank you very much dr hanlon again uh have a good evening everyone